What's up, y'all? Kofi Kingston here, and I would love to have a drink with Wrestling on the Rocks, depending on what that drink is, preferably non-alcoholic, you know? How's it going? I'm Kofi Warrior, Shane. Is- Soda. I would love to have a drink with Wrestling on the Rocks. Maple syrup. Bella. I would never have a drink with Wrestling on the Rocks. Welcome to the Dive Bar of the IWC. Welcome to Wrestling on the Rocks, Episode 1. Again, I'm at Ref Marsh. We are at WOTR, the show. With me today, a few guest drinking buddies. We're going to start with the callback from last week and newest member at Shakes NYG. Say what's up, Shakes. What's going on, wrestling fans? We got Shakes Montana in the house from the Shakedown Sports Podcast. And with us today, a not Sam Shill buddy of mine, Six Crow. Say what's up, man. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. I owed him. It turns I it, just, it wasn't exactly <laughs> like a lost bet, I get, but I I got I had, bullied. Yeah, I bullied him into it. I I mocked him on a Zoom chat where his audio sounded terrible, and next thing we knew, next week he had this incredible podcast setup, and I thought, well, if we don't put him on the show, what's it all for, <laughs> gotcha. right? Right. <laughs> Right, got to. Yeah. But okay. luckily, he's a longtime wrestling fan who I think makes great points. So it's going to be great to have him part of the conversation, anyways. I can't and wait. Since this is wrestling on the rocks, I uh-huh. could get some rocks into my drink. Yeah, what's in your glass? Well, since I can't drink alcohol anymore due to the opioid crisis and people mm-hmm. dying from mixing both, the mm-hmm. fine makers of the fine makers of marijuana put together oh. a nice drink oh. so it's not just for smoking anymore <laughs> that's right i've seen a few of those i saw like some uh some straight up sodas that were like root beer i saw a pbr then, one made a brand of okay. thc stuff yeah this is a ginger ale i have i yeah got, yeah root beer orange cola they got everything that's wow. awesome and and they won't that kill you awesome. when you eat an opioid there you go. There you go. And it's not about what you're drinking. It's who you're drinking with. And we're just happy you're drinking with us. Uh, some of the guys will even come on and uh, uh, they're just having water and stuff. But it's just that's what it is. It's about who you're drinking with. And you're happy you're a drinking buddy. Before I ask Shakes what's in his glass, I have to know, Six Crow, is that one of those Taco Bell Lord of the Ring cups? Those goblets? That is one of those goblets. <laughs> I was like, what, 98, 99? Yeah, it's the last one. The other three got broken. Ooh. So, Don't th- um, didn't those light up on the bottom? Yeah, they had a little disc that yeah. lit up on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. I had those. I, had those. <laughs> Very... I don't know about you, Shakes, but Good that was... I didn't have it. No, that's cool. <laughs> Shakes, what's in your glass? What it you looks got? cool. Uh water again, but next week I have something special for us. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh I'm taking it a little bit easy today. I'm having some uh, some seltzer, though. I'm going to have a little uh, Bud Light lemonade seltzer, strawberry, to have a little bit of a drink as we go. I picked them up the other day. Nice. But I am having it in my Feel the Glow Naomi cup in support <laughs> of Naomi. Is that a segue? It is. Is that uh, a segue? It was going to be our segue. Guys, I know typically we've set kind of a precedent where Thursdays are more of our, uh, for lack of a better term, political day. It's usually where we're a lot more uh, taking the IWC to task, where we dive in a lot deeper in conversations about rumors and news and all that type stuff. And Wednesdays, typically, we just talk about what we saw on TV. But it would be absolutely silly of us to pretend that the talk of the last two days has not been Sasha and Naomi and everything that that entails. Yeah. And I've been thinking of it as a pretty fascinating conversation to begin with. Uh, and I think when I look at it, the IWC, I think, is missing a lot of the, the boat. They're overgeneralizing. I think that before we really dive in, I just want to say that since none of us work there and none of us are millionaires, <laughs> it's going to be really hard for us to really say definitively what's right and what's wrong and who's really fucked up yeah in the in a grand scheme right like i think i think everybody saw the first statement and ran with that as yes the gospel yes and they haven't got the other three sides basically you know 
I mean, and how valid are other three sides going to be? I, I'll say that, like, as a before, because I want to pitch it over to Shakes here just a second. Uh, the former road dog Jesse James came out and said on Busted Open that if you're making millions of dollars and your biggest problem is the wrestling booker booked you in something you're not happy with and there's larger issues here than creative. And I will say that millionaires arguing over little things isn't really our moral high ground to like dive into, but I mean, it's a complicated thing. I'll say Sasha is clearly very passionate and believes a lot in the women's tag team championships. She, she fought for them for over a year. We know and she's very mm -hmm. emotional about them. Uh, to the same degree, Vince McMahon's very emotional about his company that he's been running for 50 something years. You know, we've, I saw someone else make the example of you never see people in Hollywood walk off set because they don't like the creative direction of their character. Two big flaws in that argument. One, we saw it in Fresh Prince and the show went on with a different mom. And two, they get the scripts up front months in advance. They know what's going on, right? So, this is a this is a different beast altogether. Uh, one of the big arguments I saw coming out was a lot of people are are attributing a lot of these issues and especially being referred to as unprofessional continuously throughout the show of Raw as being race driven. Uh, they gave a number of examples of that not happening on TV with uh, uh, white talent. I don't really have room to speak on that because I don't really know. I didn't get those vibes because the examples to me were were way different at a different time with different uh, fallouts. But it's really not my place to say whether or not I felt that way at all. Shakes, did you feel any of that? Uh, not to single you out, but I'm going to single you out. Oh, no, that's, like, that's cool. Speak that's on behalf cool. of it. You know I mean? <laughs> Tell me how you felt about it. What do you think about all this going on? Um, I think when... Whenever, uh, as a race, we feel slighted in any way, mm -hmm. I think we all always revert to that. Like, um, mm -hmm. you know, we get in the, the raw end of the stick. Like, mm -hmm. uh, y'all, to us, y'all have a little more leeway and a little, a little more privilege. Mm -hmm. For us, mm -hmm. we have to fight for everything that we get. Yeah. So... In saying that, I think in this situation, it's more of, um, I don't think it's like a blatant race thing, but it's, it's underlined, mm -hmm. it's undercover, you know? And I think that what you say about Sasha, Sasha, she's like me, right? Um, when you, like I, I told you, I've been um, a fan since I was three. Mm. She's the same way, right? Yeah. And, but that she took it to another level where she took notes and, and, and studied certain wrestlers and all these things. So she is an actual student of the game. Mm -hmm. So when you're a student of the game, sometimes you get to the point where you try to become the teacher because you learned everything that they try to teach you but now you see what they can do better and you're trying to add to it mm. now to get um shunned and say no we're not going to do it or we're not going to do that that way we'll take it as okay well if becky lynch would have said it you probably would have done it right mm. but because of me Oh, I, I, I get a little backlash, and I think that's where it comes into the race car point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, I guess if you're trying to think even what makes the two of us different, that's easily the, the quickest difference, right? Uh, and, and we were even talking about it last week about how much we were excited about Naomi and Sasha being tag champions, being mm -hmm. two black women champions we thought was pretty notable, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, six yeah. Crow, what were you going to say? It surprises me that race is getting brought into it because WWE is very much a leader in having um, people of color as champions, as spokesmen, as ambassadors. Yeah. And for race to be like a number one thing, you know, I, I think that's kind of a cop out. Mm. Maybe. 
maybe it's like um, an easy easy thing to point to right easy yeah um, it's it's yeah it's the easiest thing to say oh it's because of this i will say i, I think that the whole situation is much more complicated than one easy answer I'm not saying nothing is a factor, but I'm saying I think all things are a factor. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot to break down. You know, um, it, it, she was going to be, you know, a black woman against another black woman in a main event. And that's, it, it's, that's that positive. Happened. It's, it's that happened. positive. WrestleMania. WrestleMania. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna, and it's going to happen again. Yeah. And they won an SB for that. I mean, it was yeah. largely very notable by so, more than just wrestling fans. Right, so people can say maybe Sasha was jealous that, you know, her spotlight wasn't going to be, she wasn't going to be the only black main eventer. Mm. I, I would that's... be hard-pressed to buy that. Here's what I think. Yeah, I think that's a reach. Yeah, I think well, it's a little bit of a reach, but sure. I, I mean, it, the argument being out there is understandable. Someone might make that argument. Uh, yeah. I think that it really breaks down to Sasha wanting more for specifically the women's tag team championships. She even said on Broken Skull Sessions when she had that interview that one of the things she was most upset about losing the titles was that nothing happened after they lost. That they put them on no intentional disrespect to the Iconics, but they put them on the Iconics and they largely disappeared and they became oh, a joke. Yeah, and that, that killed it. And yeah. it killed it for and a while. And now floating around the IWC is that they want to take away the women's tag championship altogether. A lot of people are saying they'd right, like to see them just completely destroyed, and I don't think that that's the right answer either. No. I'm trying to think of where even to start know. with all this. Let's let's circle back a little bit. They even got the mixed tag team. I'm sorry to cut you off, but oh. they even got the mixed tag team now going on with um, Judgment uh, Day. and, Ty, and... Yeah, Or Ty Conti and... um. Oh, and Sammy Guevara out in AAA, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I don't think that division has a women's tag champions. They have a mixed tag champions, which is also a little bit weird. But um, <laughs> like I said, there's kind of a lot here. So I'm going to circle back a little bit to some of the examples people were making on why they felt it was potentially uh, – why race was a factor when it wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, Austin, Steve Austin, when he walked out in 2002, uh, right. people say that they didn't release a statement uh specifically in that statement well let me just i'm gonna run through the list they they also talked about when brock threw the universal title at vince mcmahon after wrestlemania uh which was the one in was it new orleans i think uh but we saw footage of that he threw it at him vince called him an asshole they said they didn't release a statement then uh charlotte during the title exchange with becky lynch where it kind of fell to pieces and became very unprofessional very quick that they didn't release a statement then either uh, also, when Tony Storm walked out of the company just flat out during right after a, 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 a live event, uh, she she walked off and said she flew home and said she's not coming back. And they granted her her release. And they said that no one, none of those times, did they release a statement saying that these people refused to do what they did. Um, maybe I should read the statement real quick, just so that way. I mean, I can't imagine anybody listening isn't fully aware of, but at the same time. Uh, maybe they're not. I know some people listen to this to get caught up on stuff. So, um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, it's right here. WWE released a statement. When Sasha Banks and Naomi arrived, arrived at the arena this afternoon, they were informed of their participation in the main event of tonight's Monday Night Raw. During the broadcast, they walked into WWE head of talent relations, John Laurinaitis's office with their suitcases in hand, placed the tag team championship belts on his desk and walked out. They claimed they weren't respected enough as tag team champions, and even though they had eight hours to rehearse and construct their match, they claimed they were uncomfortable in the ring with two of their opponents, even though they'd had matches with these individuals in the past with no consequences. Monday Night Raw is a scripted live show whose characters are expected to perform the requirements of their contract. We regret we were unable to deliver, as advertised, tonight's main event. And I think that's kind of the key here, is, is WWE talking about not delivering their main event. I think that in all those other examples, except for Stone Cold, Brock throwing the title, that was after the main event took place. Charlotte Belt Exchange, it was already on TV and it happened in the ring, just not the way they wanted. Tony Storm left in the middle of a program, but without an advertised match coming up and not on live TV. You know what I mean? Uh, I think 
what this really reminds me of, because when you think about back when Stone Cold walked out, they buried him on TV. They talked about, took his yeah, ball, went not, home. Yeah, they are. Get it. Uh, Yep, WWE.com had Confidential at the time, and they, they went on a thing there about how Stone Cold was being unprofessional and walked out. Uh, the Rock came out and and talked shit on Stone Cold. This is what I mean by I think everyone's emotionally driven here, is it reminded me more so of Vince McMahon doing the Brett screwed Brett after the Montreal screw job. Vince McMahon thought according to what we've heard especially with like uh bruce pritchard's podcast and all that vincent man thought that was a baby face promo that he was saving face by saying it was the talent's fault that it happened it was received very poorly by the rest of us and we all went boo <laughs> that man you know what i mean like it created the biggest heel in the business still to this day i think that vince is so emotional about his own company that when he can't deliver what he wants the way he wants doesn't word it right he doesn't handle it right he doesn't handle it well no you know what i mean like i think this was their attempt to save face and really what it did was make them look worse as it you're, you're always does when they get, try this you're trying to get ahead of the story you know make it their narrative i think well for one there's part of that but i think a big part of it is also trying to apologize to the fans for not delivering the content and really trying to say it's not our fault they're trying to not get the blame on WWE as a brand on not delivering right. and trying to say this talent behaved a certain way. The fan base, largely, we don't give a shit. <laughs> and you guys change the matches all the time. So it's yeah. like, why are you pointing fingers at them and not just weaseling it around where we don't notice? I feel like it was an emotional Vince. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, they could have put Alexa Bliss and... Uh any other female in their spot and nobody would have said anything. Maybe. Shakes, what do you think? I just think that they handle these things poorly. Every time. You know? <laughs> yep. Like, they just handle these things poorly. And, and you're right. I think that they try to uh, get a ahead of the story, make it their narrative, push it their their gender yeah i mean they're what they want mm -hmm. but um again that's the wrong way and then to to mm -hmm. add Corey Graves and, and and put him in the mix and now he's being <laughs> yeah. attacked man i yeah. mean this is all the way around just bad pr it's a mess you know, I, I don't think he E News reported on it. Roots.com reported on it. Like, there's uh, New York Post was reporting on it. Like, this has gotten big, you know. Uh, what were you going to say, Six Crow? I was going to say uh, Corey Graves would not have said that unless he was told to. Correct. Uh, 100%. He doesn't say almost anything that he is not told to. Uh, <laughs> and he's the... always attacking Sasha, so... That's what I that's think, I mean, and that's the that's why I think that they did that, you know, the you know, you, you always attacking them. Why don't you just say that, you know, yeah. say push our narrative. Yeah. And if you really the first thing he said might have been on his own, because the first thing he said was um, usually very. Uh, how did he word it? Because the first time it was mentioned was he said that. um I don't even know if he used the term professional, but he was like, usually something along the lines of being very professional. Uh, there has to be a reason why they would have walked out. You know what I mean? Like he said that it was un, it was not within their, their character to do something like that. And then everything after that became, they unprofessionally walked out. And I have a feeling that he said the original thing as a way to kind of like, Hey, there's gotta be a reason here because they're not usually like this. And that could very easily have upset someone in his ear who said, no, they did it because they're unprofessional. You say that. And yeah. like, okay, boss. Make sure you push <laughs> yeah. that. Right. Man. Yeah. Because yep. he has um, he has as much information as the viewer, pretty much. As, as what's being fed to him, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to also quickly address the idea of, like, they have never re released a statement like that before. WWE's also never been working with the newsletters before the way they are now. When Austin walked out, they went to their own website and posted something. They used uh, Confidential. They used that program, Bite This. They used WWE.com. Um, especially back in those times, uh, uh, 
they were not on friendly terms with almost any newsletter whatsoever because this is not that far removed. I know it's about 10 years removed, but it's still really close after the steroid trial, all the negative press they were getting then. Uh, just a year or two later, they were getting all the negative press about the uh, uh, sexual allegations that were coming out at the time. They cut ties with all wrestling media. Uh, they weren't talking to any of them. So there was no one to release a newsletter to that or a news news a uh, statement too that they would have been communicating with right or they would have even reported it in a way of saying this is what they told us they would have they were being bashed all the time by them where now they're trying to work more with those to get the word out they're doing the media scrums they never they never really did before so i right. think that's why you didn't see those statements before versus now they're more willing to talk to the outlets now than they were then i think it's that simple on why that came out otherwise it would have been on their dot com back kinda, in the day. you kind of have to these days though social mm -hmm. media wise. Yeah. Oh yeah. If yeah. you don't you get you, you get lost. You get lost mm -hmm. in the yeah. circles. Yeah. The second you don't you're hiding something. Yes. And then not only that, I mean just to keep up with the Joneses. You have to have a Twitter, you have to have a, a Instagram, you have to have a Facebook, you have to have a YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta have Especially with all the there. so you can't run. You can't run no more. Yeah. That's true. And with all the metrics that they're having, because before they used to just solely rely on their Nielsen ratings. We're doing this much in the ratings. Now they have to rely on this is our YouTube hits, this is our TikTok hits, this is our uh, social media impressions on Twitter. You need all those mm -hmm. things. And so. Oh, let's say, gotta generate to the um, WWE network, which is yep. on Peacock, you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, anything on those specific topics we talked about that you guys wanted to throw in? Um. I'm not done with the Sasha Naomi stuff. I want to talk about the women's tag division now. Because I want to talk about the differences between why not before and, and why now. Like I said, with Austin, they did it on their own .com at the time. They didn't talk to the media. With Brock, the main event already happened and took place the way they wanted it to. And he was just being an asshole in the back. And, and it did not affect the show. Uh, Charlotte, it was already on live TV. What are you going to do? You know what I mean? Go back and say, hey, it wasn't supposed to be that way. What they've been saying forever that if it happens on live TV, it was meant to happen because nobody knows it wasn't. You know what I mean? Um, and even then, Becky went on did some interviews where she dragged Charlotte about it. Like she she was dragged. Um, and Tony Storm again was middle of a program without something that was announced that they couldn't they couldn't get ahead of anyways. You know what I mean? This was this had happened supposedly live on air. So everyone got emotional. I'm I'm saying. Uh, uh, let's see. Let me go. Let me talk about the the women's tag division, and then we'll get back to a little bit of what's been coming out about how it all broke down that day. If that's okay with you guys. Yeah. Um. So part of the rumors was that it was seen as disrespectful. Sasha and Naomi were slated. Naomi was slated to win that match, and then Sasha was going to go on to face. Ronda Rousey at Hell in a Cell, and they were both going to go to those pay-per-views, fight the world champions, and lose without pushing any form of a tag team storyline. Uh, it was also supposedly pitched that Nikki and or Dewdrop would interfere in one or both of those matches to create the losses to help push the tag team title storyline while still giving the, the, the win to their respective champions who they wanted to win, right? Uh, I saw some people even saying when the match was first announced that it was disrespectful. Why are they in there? And why isn't it like Liv and Rhea or like you said, Alexa or something? In my mind, when I saw that they were in the match, I actually felt like it was very respectful in that I thought, oh, cool. They're saying if you're the tag team champions, you are in the conversation for being a number one contender. That if we're going to have a number one contenders match, the tag champions need to be in that match because they're champions. Therefore, they're on that level. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you're still advertising, you know, the tag team champion. You know, yes. It's still, it's still in the match. Yeah. So and then talking strictly about just being in the match, as far as what they were planning for the match, to me, putting the tag team champions in the match, everyone said, why? And my thought was, because they're saying that they're on a number one contender level, right? Yeah. Am I the only one who remind... perceived it that way? No. Oh, it's, it's a, um, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Six Girl. No, no, I said... I was just going to say it makes the uh, the tag titles look bigger when they're in a big event. That's what I thought. I, I kind of yeah. disagree. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it, it's interesting that y'all see it that way, but I kind of see it in a different way. When you put them in a, a heavyweight title match, it's kind of demonizing the tag team titles. Like, okay, that's just secondary. You know, it, like, like it, the bloodline. Then, then, like the bloodline, though. <laughs> what do you mean? No, no, no. Because you know, bloodline that's adding to the heavyweight, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. What what I'm saying is, if Sasha had won the title, now people wouldn't even care about the uh, tag team titles, right? Now I know you said that the the thing was for them to lose in that match or whatever, but it still makes that tag team titles seem like, eh, secondary. Eh, whatever. Are you they talking about the number one titles. contender match or the Hell in a Cell match that was perceived to happen? I, I, I'm saying as far as putting um, Sasha and Naomi in a heavyweight contenders match, period. Okay. Would minimize the tag team titles. It, it just will make it a, a afterthought is what I'm saying. That it will be all about the women's titles and then people wouldn't care about the tag team titles. I think that you have to kind of keep the tag team titles on the mantra of a heavyweight title because it's like okay yeah it's tag team it, it should be you are a champion and it, it's just as hard being a tag team champion as just being a singles because all you got to do is worry about yourself in a tag team you have to worry about the next man or the mm-hmm. one man you know what i'm saying that's sharing so it mm-hmm. should be up to par as a heavyweight title so you sitting there putting the t- champions in a heavyweight contendership match it's to minimizing the tag team titles in my eyes. But what about when the golden role models held the titles? Did they get the world titles before they got the tag titles, or was it the other way around? Remind me who the golden role models was. Sasha and Bailey the second time during the pandemic when they got the tag titles in. Because remember, they had the tag titles and the world titles yeah. at the same time. And I feel like that... Right. That was one of those times where it seemed like well, they were all on the same one level of them had because the raw, right? Yeah. One of them had raw, and then one of them had SmackDown, and then they were tag team champions, right? Right, I believe. But were they tag champions? I, I think they were tag champions before they got both worlds. I think I think Bailey had the SmackDown title. Yeah. They won the they tag were. titles together, and then they got them the raw title after they got Sasha the raw right, title right, after, yeah. and then they had all of yeah. them. Yeah. And at that point, that storyline made it look like the tag titles were as important as the world titles because here you had a unit trying to get it all and getting it all. So if you beat the tag champs, you beat world champs, which was kind of on that line. I see that. That That's power, right? That's like yeah. what what you're talking about with the um, bloodline, you know? Yeah. Just having all the gold. Like, I can see that. That's putting it as up there as the heavyweight championship. But when, when you sit in there and you just put them in a, a contendership for the heavyweight championship and they the tag team cha- title, I mean champions, then to me, it just deminimizes the tag team titles in my eyes. That's okay. All right. All right. Yeah, because to me, because I know that, especially because they didn't have an announced, like, method of deciding who they're getting in the match. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like, here's six people in a match for the number one contender spot. The only ones that made sense to me were Asuka, Becky, and Sasha Naomi because it's like, okay, well, Sasha, or no, because Asuka and Becky are currently in a program with Bianca. They're currently having interference there. And then it goes, well, then Naomi and Sasha would be in there just because they're champions. So therefore, they are seen on that level. And then Dewdrop and Nikki were kind of in there because I thought, well, in this match, we're going to see those two tag teams get in each other's way. And it was going to build to a tag match later, which we, which it turns out yeah, was yeah, not yeah. the goal, but was obviously right there on the table. Like, why wouldn't you? Um, right. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, so. It, yeah, I, I'm glad that you broke it down the way that you saw it because I wasn't. To me, I was like, oh, that's cool. They're saying if they're if you're tag champions, and there's no reason why you can't vie for the world title either, the women's title. Um, and then the perceived disrespect after the fact was that the that both women would be on respective singles run while tag champions without doing a tag story until after the fact. So now you're on two different singles runs, which you're slated to lose. And we're going to pick up after those losses to then pick up a tag story, 
when, like we just yeah, said, just, why wouldn't you have like a, all the interference beforehand to to be pushing the tag story along and make it feel more like a stutter for the for the women's champs than the tag champs? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like going down a dead end road. Yes. It it just you know there's no point in doing a story if there's not going to be a payoff. Yes. Yeah. Um. So. I agree that the women's tag team division is not as taken care of as a lot of people want it to be. Uh, I mean, me specifically, I have a replica of the tag title. I got it as soon as it came out. I think it's one of the, I think it's one of the most beautiful belts they have right now, to be honest. And I was choked up when the belts even were uh, displayed. And I have a, a frame on my wall of, Sasha and Bailey at the Elimination Chamber with it, with a little swatch of the, of the thing. Those titles mean a lot to me, too, because I had two uh, nieces that are just under, like, a year old when that match took place. And in my mind, I thought, they'll never live in a world with without that as a possibility. Here you had Sasha and Bailey looking up to the Hardy brothers and saying, I want to have those, but there never was those, right? Now we have a world where my nieces will never not have that as an as something to dream about and that meant option, a lot to me as right. a wrestling fan yeah right um so i'm so i am speaking on behalf of a, a, a myself saying that those titles mean a lot to me too the division means a lot to me too at the same time i can understand that the women's division is just not robust enough to to have a standalone tag division that has right. long-term uh uh teams right even the men's tag division is under fire constantly for how many tag teams do we have and are you putting some together and breaking them up? Be, and the men even have two other singles titles to go after. So you got the tag, U.S., Intercontinental, World, and Universal. With the women, you have Raw Champion, SmackDown Champion, and Women's Tag. So I feel like the right. Women's Tag is the launching point for the mid card. That's why you have like Aria and Nikki, and then Aria and and uh, Liv. It's helping get them in the ring with stars on the caliber of like a Sasha and Naomi, you so they can get that, into that main event scene. You know, you need it's, four to six teams to be able to tell a good story. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. if they're using it to push four women into the next level of their career, then you're going to be putting them together and breaking them apart all the time. You know what I mean? Right. It's just Which not as deep a roster as it should be, but it is what it is. Do you need some more of the uh, NXT girls to uh, pop up? I don't think it's an accident that we've seen a and, huge and, and, increase of women in NXT. Go ahead, Jakes. Right, and, and and to my point, what I was going to say is I think that's where they're messing up at. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know what is um, the reason for all the firings that they have had in recent mm -hmm. months. Yeah. I don't. I thought it was because of WrestleMania. They had something big in store. I thought they were gonna bring a lot of stars coming back and all this. And it wasn't like that. I mean, mm -hmm. WrestleMania was great. Don't get me wrong. It was awesome. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I I thought it was you know they were getting rid of all these guys and all these girls to bring in bigger stars, more you know more talent. But they didn't. And so it's like you're you're. You're pigeonholing yourself now because you only have so much talent. Mm -hmm. And I look at um, AEW and they got they got so much talent they don't even know what to do with them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, and that's how WWE should have been. It should be. You know, it should be where you have so much talent that you have to have a SmackDown and a Raw. It's now getting to the point where they want to unify everything because it's not enough wrestlers. <laughs> mm. I will true. say that the WWE was under fire a lot for hoarding talent and having too many people on the roster. It wasn't that long ago, even a year ago, uh, you'd hear podcasts talking about going through the roster and saying that over half these people you haven't seen on TV in six months, just let them go already. Release them. Um, I, I think that we've talked about it briefly before. I think it was episode one that, uh, I think whatever the reason being behind the majority of these releases is not something as simple as we're going to know because I think that it's boardroom level discussions of long-term business concepts just because for a while it was like, oh, it's talent they're not using. Oh, it's talent they don't have plans for. Oh, it's 
talent that, that hasn't been on TV in a long time, but then they started releasing people in the middle of storylines. You know what I mean? Like Alistair Black was scheduled for a match the next day. You know what I mean? Like uh, Bray Wyatt, ongoing storyline for a long time. They end up with a cliffhanger. You know, like it just got to a point where then you start going, oh, maybe vaccinations are a, are a concept here. And it got too messy too fast to where you just look at them all and you go, I, I don't know. There is no consistent thread through all these releases. I think that it's a much more complicated conversation that we just aren't privy to. But I agree that there's got to be somewhere in between having way too much talent and having not enough talent feels like an issue both companies are having right now. Where is that balance where you can have robust divisions for every title? You know what I mean? Like that's what you should want, right? Right. Um, but I do think the women's tag team division specifically is designed as their mid card title to launch women to the next level. And that's why the, the tag teams come and go the way they do so much. And I don't, I don't love it, but I get it, and I'm hoping that the NXT influx can help with that, can start bringing in a lot and more I women to be taxed. I think that's the problem, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but I don't think that's it. the problem, and why Sasha and Naomi is taking the stance that they're taking is like, you can do so much more with this, man. Yes. And y'all limiting yourselves. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can bring up an NXT talent, you know, for <laughs> three weeks, four weeks. Tell a story, send them back, send somebody else. And you always keep those titles. Yeah. You know, and going in track. Um, yeah. I do think that the women's tag titles are, it feels like Sasha's baby. You know what I mean? Like, I think she's emotional about it, and she should be. And I think because she's got so much in that Up, Up, Down, Down episode where her and FTR were sitting down, or well, it was Bailey, Sasha, and FTR were sitting down talking about it. FTR was just telling, recounting how they saw them knocking on Vince's door every single day for over a year to get these titles and how much it meant to them. And Sasha and Bailey were crying before they even got to respond because it meant that much to them. So I do think that... Sasha's trying to get those tag titles back up to a point of being meaningful and being standalone and like she doesn't have to be in the tag she could be a single star yeah she's choosing to be in the tag division and on Twitter like once a week she thanks Vince McMahon she sends a thank you to him once a week so something really big must have transpired for yeah for her to walk away i think that she must have felt disrespected uh absolutely i think she she was fighting for those titles i don't know do you think it's a conversation even breaking down like where's the divide between a talent being told being doing what they're told to do versus standing up for what they think is right and where's that line because there's got to be a line right where you're a character on a show and there's also like you can demand more you know what i mean and and who are you helping and who you're hurting in those instances like i have no idea where that line is i i'm inclined to agree that you gotta fight and you gotta stand up for yourself but at the same time i'm not paid millions of dollars to do a thing i've been paid a lot less to do shit i did not agree with (laughs) you know what i mean and sometimes you just do your job because it's what your job is and it's tough i do think that we as uh I mean, society on a whole, we glorify millionaires and try to make them relatable to to those of us who scrape by check to check. And I do think that those mentalities are significantly different. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think um, when you talk about that line, I, that those lines get blurred, especially when you're a superstar, right? Yeah. Because it's like, at that point in time and even if it's not true in your head it start to become true is like um am i bigger than a company or you know can i uh go off on my own and still be good you know and i'm big enough a person to do that so if that is the case i can fight way more harder on my on what Mm -hmm. i want to do compared to somebody that's fighting to stay on the roster. Yep. 
I feel I bad it. for Naomi because I don't think she has as much pull as Sasha does. So it's going to hurt her more I in the long run. I think she has more pull than we actually really believe, though. Because, I agree with that. Um, She's been there longer than any other woman on that roster, except maybe Natty. Been there longer. Her husband is is a Uso, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so she's she's in the royalty family of that, you know, that Uso family, that um, that, okay. that whole bloodline family tree. I, I think that she does have a lot more pull than people actually think. I agree, but I do also okay. agree with Six Crow that it could hurt her in in some regards. Uh, I mean, it's like they say in billions. I know what you were saying, Shakes. What's the point of having fuck you money if you don't say fuck you from time to time, you know? Uh, <laughs> and it's kind of like what happened with, with Moxley, right? He he didn't want to resign because he had enough money to live off of so he could just do what he wants right. to do. And I think about that all the time. I watch these shows about people who go on and make millions and millions, and they're fighting for an extra $2 million or $3 million, And I was like, God damn, if someone gave me $1 million, I'd walk away. You know what I mean? Because like, right, you can right? live off that, right? Like. Right. Um, but at the same time, I'm not in those conversations. So maybe if I was, right. I'd say maybe but I could hold I, out for more, yeah, right? I mean, like, yeah, you you got to think, like, you have a different mentality. You got $70 million in the bank. And somebody come to you and say, well, yeah, take this $3 million. Well, fuck you. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> right? And so if you're someone like a Sasha who, who, let's say she doesn't have mainstream appeal. Let's say she's just made what she's made in WWE. She's made enough to be able to walk away anyways, right? Like, yeah. She couldn't live comfortably She's from there on before. out. <laughs> She's, She's done, done it before. She's done it before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I agree. I think that you got to stand up sometimes. Um, I haven't been trying to defend Vince or the WWE in any of this, but I do think that the conversation's worth having because I I'm more interested in the conversation than the the staunch. These people are bullshit. I don't think it's as easy as I've seen some people speculate that WWE needs to issue this massive apology and beg Sasha and Naomi to come back. I hear that, but also it's the fucking WWE. They're the they're one of the biggest companies in the world. They make the most money out of any wrestling company. If you think the company wouldn't work Man. well without those two, then you don't remember what happened when Austin walked out. You know what I mean? The Rock left. Like, they're fine. They don't need any of these talent. I don't mean that to diminish these talent. I think the show is better with them. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. You know? I don't know that, if that means that... that... What I think is this. I don't think that either side needs to grovel. But I do think that both sides work better together than apart. And what I want is for all of them to get into a room and say, what do we do next? How do we move forward? What's best for both sides, right? Because right. Yeah. it also sets a precedent either way, right? If you're a talent then, who, who throws your title on there and walks away, you, do you set the precedent that you can do that. Parties, mm-hmm. But what's best for all parties? Yes. The, the 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 consumer included. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The How do we change the division. narrative? Not just my narrative. The fans. But yeah. for the fans too. Yeah. How do we make a story out of this now? Boom. And that's what I think is secondary. The amount of people who have to be so fucking smart to call everything a work just so they can't get fooled, yeah. I think is ridiculous. Because <laughs> you fool yourself into thinking everything is fake when some things are not, right? I do think there's a balance, and I think the, the, the thing that people also confuse is there's a massive difference between using reality to work a storyline and the difference between working reality to create a storyline. People confuse those so much, and when they see something appear on TV, they go, see, obviously fake, obviously it'll work the whole time. No, sometimes they just take reality and put it in there because it's more fun and easier to get invested into when they blur that line. And as long as Vince McMahon's always been running the company, it's always been that what's best for business, he's always blurred the line because it's better for them and it's more entertaining for the fans. And I do think that that's a number one priority. I'm excited to see if we can get everyone in one room to say, what do we do here? They're going to use this. Do you think you could use this specifically to get back into the shows a little bit to get Naomi into the bloodline? To have her push in her, you know, pull in her weight, to have her her force in their hands, to even have a Paul Heyman speaking on behalf of her all of a sudden, you know what I mean? Like, could you use this reality to create a world where you've turned Sasha and Naomi heel and joined up with the bloodline? Mm-hmm. 
think they should. <laughs> and I, <laughs> you know I do. <laughs> but I think that is great for um, storylines. It's mm-hmm. great for reality because what do the people eat up most? Reality-based things, right? Yep. <laughs> like, if mm-hmm. you sit there and give us the real, like, we sitting there like, oh, no, wait a minute. That, that's real. Like, it, how it, great it, when it like, draws, Edge, like Edge and Matt Hardy, when they mm-hmm. had that. Exactly. Right? Like, it wait was a minute. So, yeah, it was exactly. so real. Exactly. That's real. Right? Yep. It's, so even you know, in TNA, kinda, the Jeff and, Jarrett and Kurt Angle mm-hmm. stuff. Jeff yeah. Jarrett and Kurt Angle, remind me of that one. Uh, oh, oh, Matt, no, Kurt's, you ain't got to. I remember. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but yes, um, yeah. When you can implement real life things that's going on into the camera, like the people can see that, like. Oh wait a minute, that that's real, and they gravitate to it. So, if you can do that, because the people would eat that up. I mm-hmm. mean, it's already, you know, what I mean, that yeah. the Uzo is her husband. It just makes sense. It makes sense, and you'll be like, oh. And then with this going on, oh, it, it, it's perfect. They yeah, should. And then, and then you get to the point where you start going that's like, oh, was it supposed to happen or not supposed to happen? And at the end of the yeah. day. That's what's best. It kind of even reminds me. I was talking a little bit about it when we saw it, the uh, the new Spider Man movie, uh, No Way Home, when they incorporated Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. I was like, I was talking to my brother, and I was like, it was so brilliant that they tied those stories in, so it suddenly made it feel like all of the things that we knew were reality. The contract disputes, Sony and Marvel butting heads, the the inability to use Spider Man in things like the Avengers. It made it all seem like storyline. It made it all seem like it was for this greater purpose of this multiverse concept that they're going through. And my brother goes, who in the world is so uh, – who who in the entire ent- entertainment world could do something that that's that clever where you could make something real look like it's been worked the whole time? And I was like, dude, wrestling. Wrestling is the only thing. That's why I love this movie. It was a pro wrestling Spider-Man movie. They took reality and made it seem like it was supposed to happen. Right. So I do think that then you get all the people on the other side saying, like, see, I knew it was fake all along. You go, no, no, no. They're just smarter than you all (laughs) along. And they knew how to work it so you wouldn't know the difference anymore. And that's what's fun, you know? Absolutely. That's my thoughts. But I don't know. I feel like we hit a lot of the points there that I thought a lot of people were missing. I think people have oversimplified this to being that they're disrespected and they should walk out. I think they've oversimplified WWE is a massive machine and no one should ever walk out. They've oversimplified it was strictly due to race. They've oversimplified that they never did this before back in 2002 when the newsletters were not as prevalently necessary for their business. So I wanted to dig into all those things because I felt like a lot of people are going like, this is it and this alone. Where when I'm looking at all these things from the sides, I'm going like, this is a big thing. This is big, big. Right. Like, there's a lot here. Bigger than Nino Brown. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah dude um is there anything on the subject that either of you specifically wanted to bring up or talk about or that you even came across that we hadn't mentioned that you you think we should dig into no i think i'm gonna wait till i get more information before i uh that's the other thing before i right. make any more <laughs> statements yeah. right yeah because just like i said we only know a portion of what really happened. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that we all agree that we all love Naomi and Sasha and want them in that company. We love them as champions. Yeah. And we want to see this all kind of pan out and to get more of them on TV. And I want to see a women's division that's so strong that people think that those titles are undeniable. Can I take this time? Yeah. If you listen to Sasha, you (laughs) have a big fan right here. That's true. I would love you than any man in this world. Give me mm-hmm. a call. Mike can't fight. <laughs> can't fight. <laughs> I got him. I yeah. thought you only liked heels. Hey. Yeah. She's such I'm a good heel, exception. they made an evil documentary about her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I love that line. You don't make kids and cry, man, but Shasha Banks does. 
what Sasha Banks does. That was best. Yeah. That was a oh man, that was awesome. Yep, yep. I man. love that one. I can watch that over and over. I love you, yep. Sasha. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Yo, we love Naomi here. Naomi's the reason that my girlfriend, the producer of the show, even got into wrestling. We started watching Total Divas a little bit here and there. She totally fell in love with Trinity and her husband and just thought they were the greatest couple ever. And then all of a sudden she sees a clip on that show of Naomi's entrance. And she goes, you didn't tell me there was dancing on that show. And I was like, well, yeah, when Naomi comes out. And so then from then on, anytime Naomi was on any show, she had to be there. She had to watch it. And everything else hooked her, you know, like, I but if it wasn't for Naomi, we wouldn't, you know what I mean? I think nice. Naomi's booty should have her own Twitter page. <laughs> Messed, up. Messed up. Probably does, knowing a lot of these weirdos online. Probably does You're have right. some sort of fan page, at least. You're right. Yep, yep. Sportsbeard coming through the chat. Cheers, Sportsbeard. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the shows, though? Or is there any other news that you guys thought we should, should go into? But I just thought, let's open the show and dive into what people are talking about. Yeah, that was the hot topic, right? Yeah. Um, yeah I think, you know, I think that was sense. amazing what I wanted to hit on was that topic yeah. there. So. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to have you here to weigh in on what, what you saw too and what you felt about it because I think that, you know, there's definitely – what I like about the show is the, the multitude of perspectives that we can get here, the drinking buddies, as it were. Yeah. Absolutely. Shout out, Beard. Yeah. Shout out to Beard. Bringing it together. Uh. Let's go through a little bit. I think we're just going to highlight stuff because I don't want us to be here all day breaking down everything. But there was a lot of stuff that happened here. Uh, SmackDown on a whole, I really enjoyed. Opened up with RK Bro coming out to challenge the Usos. And locker room leader himself, Sami Zayn, came out to address the issue, to address the problem at hand, wearing his Bloodline shirt and all. Oh, man. Sami Zayn. Great. He's incredible. I usually don't like comedy and wrestling, but and him we, and Kevin Owens can do it perfect. Yeah, man. They're awesome. And we just spoke about it last week, right? Mm -hmm. Like being an honorary member of the bloodline. And then yeah. he comes out with the shirt on. And he's just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I couldn't. Awesome, I could barely man. handle it. It was so great. Uh, ultimately, he does talk himself into a match against Riddle. I like how he was saying, like, the, you know, Orton was trying to say, like, oh, I'm, I'm so impressed by how much pull you have with the bloodline that you can make these decisions. <laughs> so good. He ends up in a match with Riddle. Dude, Sami Zayn and Riddle together? Like, I thought it'd be good, but damn. Like, they went. Like, they went like it was a premium live event, I felt like. Like, that was an amazing way to start off the show. And even yeah, but... the point, um, my bad, but uh, just the point of, remember we was talking about last week, uh, winning matches the sleazy way or whatever, and he tries mm -hmm. to do it again. They yeah. tried to get another <laughs> count out, man. That was hilarious. I'm sorry, Six Pro. Go ahead, bro. So good. Oh, no problem, dude. I would just, I would love to see a program with like Sammy and Kevin Owens versus RK Bro. Mm. That would be that would be hilarious. Yeah, okay. that would work out so well. I agree with you too, Six Crow. There's a lot of comedy in wrestling. I'm not a fan of because I think a, I think I judge comedy more harshly than I judge wrestling. Um, yeah, when you and I think a lot of people are not funny when they think they are, and I think that sitting on a whoopee cushion verbally is not always like <laughs> the end all be all of jokes to me. But uh, no. I, I do think that Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn have realized the subtlety and artisticness that can be comedy in wrestling. Yeah. AJ Styles too. The, the, like the real trick of it is that those, that they have to take themselves seriously. Right. You can't be looking into the camera the whole time and winking and giggling because you come off looking like an idiot where if you I take yourself seriously, it's going to be funny. I understand the need for it. Cause there are, you know, kids that watch, so they got to kind of play to them, but I can only take so much before it's I have to, to walk out now. Yeah. yeah. And I'll be honest with you. No, I personally am not a know. fan of Riddle's comedy. I'm sorry. Oh, no? No. no. But, but that's also has to do with, with – I'm not a fan of stoner comedies. Like 
I really liked Half Baked, but outside of that, I'm not a big fan of Cheech and Chong. I'm, I didn't like White Castle. I don't. I'm not a fan of just it's funny that I'm stupid. This Homer Simpson stoner concept uh, doesn't yeah, land for me. Right. He's very slow. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, like slow. Yeah, very Spicoli. Spicoli in Fast Times does not interest me as a character. I've never thought he was funny. Like I don't think being a dumb stoner to me is funny. Um, but I do think that the way Orton responds to Riddle is funny. Like they make the the team work to where you want to see it because you want to see how because I want to see how Orton's going to react, right? Uh, Sammy's yeah. reactions right. to Riddle is funny, but I don't find Riddle when he's talking to be funny. You know what I mean? Right. And I think um, to your point, Six Crow, uh, the subtle, the subtlety, like mm-hmm. in the, yeah. the comedy. Yeah. And other other wrestlers like. It's just coming off as you're trying too hard. You, you're coming off corny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But with Sami Zayn and uh, and um, Kevin Owens, it's so subtle. It's just mm-hmm. so subtle that and what you said, Marsh. You know, they take it seriously. Like, like right now, I can just be like, um, yeah, like he's a he's a liar. Like yeah. Elias is a liar. Like, yeah, but that, and, but that and, whole... and stick to it. Like, don't, don't, don't break away and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that... like, no, like, really, like, stay to it. Like, I am really pissed the hell off because y'all are all liars. I know y'all liars because that is, a... that is, that's, that is what is funny. Yes, yeah. that's comedy. That should not, not work at all. Trying so hard, yeah, not trying so yeah. hard. Yeah. That's what Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens got. You're right. And the other one I think does it perfectly is AJ Styles. He's a character that takes himself so seriously that when weird things happen around him, it's hysterical. Because his character doesn't know how to handle it. Because his character is serious. And it's just, mm-hmm. it works out so funny. Uh, but yeah, I loved all of that. Sami Zayn's incredible. I wanted to get your guys' take on Ronda Rousey. A lot of people are not feeling this run of Rhonda. A lot of people are very critical of her abilities talking on the mic. I'm going to say what I think, and I don't know what you guys think. For me, what works about it is that she sounds like somebody talking to an audience. She doesn't come off as a as someone pretending to be a mean wrestler, and she doesn't have um, that classic wrestler cadence. She doesn't yell into the microphone because I'm an angry wrestler, and that's what wrestlers do. Uh, even Sami Zayn said in an interview with Chris uh, or with uh, Ryan Satin that when he first showed up in NXT, that Dusty Rhodes had told him the days of the screaming wrestler are over. That it's a lot about subtlety now. You know, like yeah. it's about being real now. Um, it's not She's the 80s authentic. where you just yelled and pointed. You know, yeah. that's the feeling I get from Ronda. She comes off authentic. She comes off as somebody yeah. who's in front of a crowd and talking to them. And some for some reason people aren't taken to it. Are you guys ones not taken to it? We'll start with Six Crow and then go Shakes. I uh, love it. I think it sounds authentic, sounds real, doesn't sound uh, rehearsed. Mm. Just sounds like she's, you know, just talking. She's a fighter, you know, mm-hmm. a fighter first. Yeah, Shakes. What do you okay. think of it? Yeah. All right. Well. As far as her mic skills, right? I'll speak that first because that's what you're asking about. Mm-hmm. And her mic skills, I, I do like it. I do like it. I think she has improved in the mic. I think that the way she's approaching the mic is is great. I personally like this Ronda Rousey coming back and not even, not the first thing. And she didn't do bad the first thing. Mm. But in this thing, she just seems like she is more involved with the company. The first time it was like, oh, I'm a superstar coming into this company. So, you know, bring out the red carpet. This time, I just see she's like one of the girls in the Mm -hmm. back in the locker room. You know, um, when she takes the bumps and the bruises compared to before, she will bounce back up and it's like it didn't even affect her. Mm. This time, it's more acting. It's more acting involved. 
she's actually, oh my gosh, I, my arm is hurt. And I'm like, wow, I am very impressed by what is she bringing in the ring, mm -hmm. performance-wise and also on the mic. I thought she did amazing with this match she had with Raquel yeah. Rodriguez. I thought she was selling her ass off and made Rodriguez look like a real threat, but also made it look like Ronda was just hurting from her last match. Oh, you man, know what I mean? that was a beautiful match, man. That was yeah. a great match. Shout out to Rodriguez. I, I didn't yeah. even like her before that match, but she impressed me. Mm. Here's my feeling on her was that uh, I, I think she's going to turn heel and be uh, – the muscle for maybe a returning Bailey and mm -hmm. Bailey and uh, Ronda Rousey probably have a a good program. A war, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. with uh, Rodriguez being you know the muscle for her. I can see that. Be interesting. I initially That's my thought that we were going to get Bailey coming back with somebody to face off with Sasha and Naomi. That I thought that we'd get a Bailey back, that upset that Sasha bad. turned her back, awesome. uh, and joined a tag team with someone other than her, and so have that scorned Bailey thing. And then Raquel would be perfect for that. Now you mention it. Yeah. yeah. That's my far out prediction. Hey, <laughs> what about Bailey gave Charlotte a call? And then we no. get the four horse for <laughs> don't tag want anything teams. to do with Match. Bailey and Charlotte. <laughs> Although <laughs> Bailey's the one who consistently beats Charlotte, which I like that a lot. Uh, real quick to hit the chat, Sportsbeard said, "Edge just tweeted out a picture of Champa. Does that mean he's in the gang? It definitely means that that, that Edge is looking at Champa, and I do think Champa would fit would in a member of the Judgment awesome. Day. That would be awesome. Yeah, that could be sick." That could be really good. Uh, let's see. Um, do you, did you get the uh, an Undertaker ministry vibe from Edge and Judgment Day? Uh, not really. Ministry? I mean, kind of ministry? I, I, I mean, he's I, even more like the purple tights. Uh, and, uh, they just, yeah, it's match. like that cult following type of thing. But yeah. to me, it's like... um. They doing like a Lucifer type of thing with me. Hmm. Yeah. It's like um Illuminati type of a thing. Yeah, I could see that. I'm just still not really feeling I'm not buying into Edge in this at all. Like I buy into Damien and Rhea. Mm -hmm. The Edge comes off like someone acting. Like just because it's such a departure in what we know and in his um in his return, even like I mean, like Sports Free says, throwback to the Brood. Yeah, it is. It is, but also Edge went away from the Brood pretty fast and never looked back for a very long time. And to be all like, oh, it's always been a part of him. Not really. It really wasn't right. until he came back and used it as a nostalgic thing. Like, right. it just was such. It just wasn't who he was. And I don't know. This, this feels. I don't know. It just feels like an actor showing up and doing something. You know what I mean? Like, and it's not trying to dig on Edge. I think Edge is incredible. I think that the reason it's working is because I think he's got a lot of good faith in the fan base who says, "Sure, Edge, whatever you want to do, you're gonna do it to the, you're gonna do it great." And he does a great job with it. But and it's still like, great, doesn't make sense. They got great opponents right now too. You know? Yes. The uh, yeah. the Bullets Club. <laughs> well, we're gonna get there. We're still on SmackDown. So before we get to yeah. all that. What would you think of the Madcap Moss taking that chair around the neck wow. and uh, Baron Corbin whacking him off there with the uh, with the Andre the Giant trophy? Who are you going to, me? Yeah, let's go Shakes. It was brutal looking, wasn't it? I, I thought... don't think I'm going to be light so much on this show anymore. <laughs> right? Because I mm -hmm. loved every minute of it. <laughs> I loved every minute of it. It may have been gruesome. It may have been harsh. But I'm like, that's what a heel does. Yeah. That's what a heel does. Take yeah. him out. How can you tell jokes now? Jo -jo -jo -jo. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that chair folded up around him. And when I first saw it, I was like, holy shit. Like, it was brutal. But then I also thought, well, we just saw this dude bounce off his neck one time. We know his neck's made out of tractor tires. So he'll yeah. probably be okay in real life. But that looked fucking good, dude. It looked 
Oh man, the trophy onto the chest. Oh man. Yeah. Thanks, girl. What'd you think? <laughs> yeah, I I saw yeah, that. Bro. That was brutal. Yeah. Yeah. The bad uh, man, Baron. And I like the Corbin saying, uh, "Good luck to them at the hospital." Matt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was, no, that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. He like stops them and everything so he can make his pun joke. I was like, okay. Okay. It did make uh, it did make Baron a badass again, though. Yes, yes, it did. Yes, it really did. It did. Uh, Natalia and Shayna versus Boston Glow. Here is one of the things I was thinking about when all those first reports were coming out saying that they weren't respected as tag champions. My first thought was, we just saw you in an incredible match in defense on SmackDown. We've been seeing you guys out there every week supporting these tag titles. Like I don't understand. As more and more of the reports came out, and it was more about what was to come and not what has been. That's when it all kind of fell to place of like, oh, okay, I see, I see the argument now in a much different light. You know what I mean? Uh, but this match in and of itself, I thought was incredible. Yeah, I was glued. What do you guys think? I could see uh, both queens as tag champions, queen of hearts, yeah. queen of spades. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the I way would they were totally working for that. Naomi's shoulder. Yeah, I thought it was great. What do you think, Shakes? No, um, I I agree with Six Pro, and I was actually trying to think of a name for them, right? Because th- I I like that mantra, like yeah. um, Queen of Spades, you know, Queen of Hearts, you know that that's that's cool. So I don't know yeah. what you know what do you call them the deck of cards. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I was trying to think of something, but you know, I like that. I like that tag team because you know, um, they both are submissive, submission yeah. um, masters. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, to get two submissive matches or uh, ma- masters in what they do, mm-hmm. like it just fits. It fits um, everything. And then, um, yeah. 100%. like I said last week. Um, they both have a connection with Ronda Rousey, which yeah. they should make a whole fucking uh, team. Nick. But, yep. Yeah. yep. I agree. Justin Time coming through the chat. Cheers to Justin. And we got King Jaguar Spy. So much love from a random French internet stranger. Cheers, King Jaguar. What are you drinking? Cheers. What are you having? Um, yeah, I agree with all that. Drew Gulak getting the absolute soul slapped out of him by Gunther was pretty sick. Um, Kingston and Butch. This match was very good, but I'm also like, here's my here's my qualm with it all. I don't understand how this rivalry just keeps going. I feel like, I feel like there's not much story here, but they keep having matches, and in turn the matches are great. They've never had a bad yeah. match with any iteration of New Day with them. I mean, apart from that horrible injury. The match itself wasn't a bad match. It was a terrible spot, right? So I think the chemistry is there. I just don't understand why it just keeps happening in all these different iterations. Uh, but I, this was another I great think, match. I'm ready yeah. to kind of move on, though. What do you think, Six Bro? I, I think they're uh, they were waiting for Big E to come back, and he got delayed. I guess a couple weeks ago they said it wasn't uh, healing properly. So I think now they're just trying to find a way to get out of it. Hmm. What do you think, Shakes? Uh, kind of agree with um, Six Pro. Kind of stole my thunder a little bit there because um, I think that's what it is. They want to have this uh, this three man war, this six man war, really, uh, three on three, and um, Big E's injury kind of delayed that. Now here's the thing. That's fine. That's fine. You know, you can't call an injury, you know. Mm. But you did what you did with it right for now. Now put a cap on it for now. Yeah. And yeah. two big E can come back and then you can make it a big war because now you already have like they have yeah. bad blood. 
They yeah. had bad blood from months ago. Now Big E's back, and now they can have a war, right? Exactly. I think that, yeah. But I think they did. They dragging it, and I think it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. I want both these guys in programs I can at least seek my teeth into because they're all good. Everyone in this and these matches, like I said, are awesome. But yeah, at a certain point, we gotta gotta go. I can only take so many small packages and roll ups. All right. <laughs> Backwards. <laughs> Backwards. Hell yeah. Uh, Sports Beard says that he's sad that Naomi and Sasha won't be tag champs anymore. Um, really sucks because he loved that program. I'm also not convinced that they're not. I just think that we're in a standstill and we got to figure out what's happening. And um, I think that we might see them come back. I, I don't. I think that I, I saw one rumor that I think was uh, as much as I don't buy into anything Meltzer says most of the time. I do think this is such high profile that I don't think they're going to be leaking bad information. Um, the rumor is that uh, WWE doesn't want to suspend Naomi or Sasha and wants them back on the program as soon as possible. So I do think that both parties likely want to make this work, but I do think they'll both parties down. have something they'll to stand down. down. Talk it out. Yeah, yeah, they'll sit down and talk it out. Yeah, and um, it'll be very disrespectful if they put the belts on somebody else. It would be crazy, dude. Can you imagine the backlash that it would get if all of a sudden you just had like one match for – just throw yeah. back on like Carmella and Zelina, people be fuck pissed, dude. Not that there's anything wrong with Zelina and Carmella, but I'm saying like if you just suddenly strap those on someone else, people be like the fuck. Um, Justin Times says so concerned that this New Day feud with Sheamus and friends is going to go as long as the Rollins Mysterio feud did. That would be insane. Yeah, but also it's another one where it's like when you have so many good matches, it's hard to say like I don't want to see another one of those matches, but you just want to care more. You know what I mean, like. That's kind of where I'm at with the New Day and Fight Night. These matches are great, but I don't know why anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> but Hey, I just came up with it. Mm. <laughs> what have we called them? Queens. Oh, yeah, Six Crows. Uh, yeah, Queens. You could even do like Queens of Submission, Submission Queens. You could do Queens Combat. You could do all sorts of stuff with it. You know? Yeah problem with Queens of Combat is I believe in North Carolina there is a uh, small women's wrestling promotion called Queens of Combat, so you'd have an issue there. But you could do something along those lines. Uh-huh. Uh, the face-off at the end of the show with the Bloodline and RK Bro, uh, really I just want to get your guys' take, uh, apart from all the backstage stuff with Sami Zayn, which was just fucking golden and amazing and made this whole show yeah. feel so easy to watch. Uh, Riddle hits Roman with the knee. <laughs> What do you guys think about that? I think uh, that's going to be some foreshadowing where uh, Roman's going to probably hit him back during the uh, uni- unification match. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Shakes? I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. What was the question? What do you think about Riddle take uh, giving a knee to Roman? Now, you know I couldn't stand that, man. I was mad. <laughs> I was <laughs> mad, <laughs> man. Like, oh, you just going, oh, you just sneaky one, huh? Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I think that's like um one of those warning shots. Not mm-hmm. as far as um, Riddle. I mean, it, it could be taken as that, too, you know, from Riddle to Roman. But it's more um, from WWE to the to the fans right it's like a warning shot get ready and gear yeah. up because riddle is going to be in the heavyweight contendership match so he'll be in that picture soon so uh giving that little warning shot that little knee is just a uh little oomph to give in a maybe a possible war later on That's what I said. but yeah i couldn't stand it i ain't like riddle you gonna get yours for that <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it was like I said during the the six man tag. It looks like Roman's poised to go up against anyone in there. Riddle, Orton, Drew. It seems like we got a we got something there. So yeah. I don't know. I wasn't. I didn't suspect it was going to end that way. I thought Roman did an amazing job selling it. The way he was kind of like jarred and holding his jaw. Right. 
snaps it at Heyman, get, pick up my titles. Like, he was fucking good. Uh, anything else on SmackDown for you guys ready to go on to Raw? Not that I can remember. Raw opened up with the Steel Cage match almost at Lashley. Shakes, you and I called it both last week here on episode one. We said, those are a couple big boys. One of those walls is coming out, isn't it? <laughs> and it did. The cage is coming down. <laughs> <laughs> we said it. Yeah. And it did. Yeah. As soon as he threw him towards it, I was like, here it goes. And it did. It That's was awesome. It. I thought it was going to happen earlier because um, I think uh, Omos had uh, spirit head him to the cage. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought it was going to happen that time. But, mm-hmm. you know, he just bounced off it. And I was like, okay, no. But, and hopefully <laughs> that'll be the last time that they do that. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be for at least a little while. Third time in the cage. two years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would you think about Cedric and MVP uh, interfering so much? Um, all right, so listen, right? I... Y'all know by now I've been saying this, this third show. I love the stables. I love the <laughs> the groups, the cliques, right? And I was a big hurt business fan. Yeah, they were like, great. Brothers that were serious in suits mm-hmm. that kicked ass. Mm-hmm. I mean. That was awesome for me, and then <laughs> to have a war in a in a battle with the new day, I was like, "Oh, that this is awesome. This this works." But then yeah. they lost the titles to the new day, and I was like, "So, brothers in business suits going to lose to brothers with unicorns?" Hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> didn't like that. Right, but I bring that up because I like what they're doing with Shelton Benjamin. Like they're not wasting him, and they're putting him in this uh, storyline, which he. Oh, you mean Cedric? I mean Cedric. Excuse me, my bad. I'm thinking about Shelton Benjamin, but yes, Cedric Alexander, and um, they put him in this storyline, which he should be in. This should be something that he helps Omos. This should be uh, 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 the Hurt Business uh, 2.0, right? Lashley ain't want no part of that, that, and that's fine. But Omos could definitely use that. He can definitely use that. So I like it. I like the fact that they put in um, uh, uh, why I keep calling him Benjamin? (laughs) Alexander into the uh, mix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Benjamin actually just said the other day that he's injured, and that's why he's out right now. But so hopefully, and I'm pretty sure he would be in that mix too if yeah. he wasn't injured. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but otherwise, I liked it. A lot of people were tired. I, I here's the thing: is I know a lot of people have been tired of the almost Bobby Lashley thing. I haven't been. I've been really enjoying it. I think it's making them both look pretty good. However, at the end of this show, they announced that there's going to be some other challenge that Lashley has, the almighty challenge for Olmos. Yeah. And that one, I said, that's too much. We've gone too far. Like, we just, we're done. <laughs> the cage was it. Like, it's, let's all move on. But this like weird what? almighty challenge after the fact, I'm not on board for. Like, like what you mean with the almighty challenge? That's all they said. They said it's the almighty yeah. challenge, and we're going to find out next week what that means. Bobby Lashley has a challenge I mean, for Olmos. Like, but he won. Okay. What was the first Almighty Challenge? It was a already an Almighty Challenge? No, there wasn't. They had this match, and then at the end of the show, they said Bobby Lashley has an Almighty Challenge for almost next week. We'll find out what that means. Hmm. Yeah. Very vague. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're doing, they doing too much. Yeah, I'm ready for that one to move on. I've liked it more than most. A lot of people I've seen complain about it. And I've been defending it left and right. And at this point, this one, I went, okay, that's too much. I thought this was going to be the right way to cap it off and be like, we're just done for now. We're going to go separate ways. We'll revisit this later. And then it just it wasn't. It's not done. I just don't. I don't get it. 
what do you think about the Ali Miz stuff? I've seen people speculate this is all punishment for Ali, but I don't know how I feel about that. Veer Mahan coming in, beating the shit out of him. Uh, Mysterio's coming in and jumping him. Austin Theory coming in, taking a selfie of him. What do you think of it all, Shakes? I don't. I'm so, um, I know how to say crow. I'm a, I ain't going to be too long. I got you. Right? <laughs> yeah. But I don't think it's punishment. I Like, if it was punishment, they would keep them off the camera like they have been doing. They would keep them off the tube. I mean, we ain't seen Ali in months. Hmm. Weeks, months. And now he, he's popping up and he has a storyline. To me, that's a push. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's going to have a really good match with uh, Austin Theory. I don't think. Uh, I, I don't think he's, I don't think he'll get the title, but I think they'll have a great match. They might put it on. Oh, man, they might I think he might on. win the title. I really do. Mm-hmm. I think there's a good shot for it, but at the same time, I would see either side of it because they clearly have big thoughts for uh, for Theory. Theory. Big plans. Yeah. Uh, Miz is one of those ones who I think tries too hard and so I think it comes across as corny a lot uh, like we were talking about earlier I'm happy to see the Mysterios back uh, this just kind of felt like a mess of a segment though felt like they had a lot in a little you know what I mean you had Theory and Ali you had Miz come out then you had Veer come out then you had the Mysterios come out and I just felt like yeah, they're coming a lie in here you know uh you know, real quick about the Miz, man, that's, that's yeah. um, interesting and funny to me, right? Is that you say that about him on the mic and do too much. And yeah, he does at, at a lot of times, right? But it gets to a point where, like, even when he's serious and mad, you really can't even take him serious. For mm-hmm. example, right? When when he had that um, battle with Daniel Bryan mm-hmm. and they had that thing on smack and on um, talking smack mm-hmm. and that was real yeah but at the same time like as you watching I don't know about you but for me I was like is this still the storyline I'm still eating popcorn like oh this is good <laughs> <They're> like <laughs> right so I, yeah. I, I didn't know yeah. if it was real or fake still, right? But he was yeah. really upset. Like, he was really upset. And to me, that was the best Miz i ever seen. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah, and I think he tries too hard to be funny too often that when he even does serious stuff, you just kind of go, okay. Like, yeah. But. Exactly. Yeah, that was notable at the time. Uh, Becky Lynch backstage with Adam Pierce. Becky Lynch is just incredible. Like it's not a surprise that if if the if it played out the way they said and 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 Naomi and Sasha walked out it, w- it wouldn't be a surprise that Becky would be the one that they would call on to to help fix that situation you know mm-hmm. uh, at least on TV storyline wise right um, who was she tagged with though she didn't tag with anybody she was just there to talk to Adam Pierce about how the match shouldn't happen about how she saw Sasha and Naomi walk out and like hey look we can't even do it. And then Adam Pierce was like, uh, fuck it, we'll make it a one on one you and Asuka, you know. Oh. I thought you meant like, um, if things don't work out with Sasha and Naomi to put her in that mix. Oh, and that's yeah. why I was like, Oh, who is she tagged with? But go ahead, Bailey. I get what you're saying. No. <laughs> yeah, uh no, no, I meant like in the moment of like how are we gonna move this yeah. to a point where like, you know, and Becky's just such top tier that she can. I saw a lot of people criticize both Seth and Becky. Uh for Seth's or for Becky's involvement here, uh, I mean, but I also don't understand what people think. Like, do you think that the entire locker room is going to walk out in the middle of a live show? You know what I mean? It's just kind of yeah. weird. You let people do what they're going to do, you know. So yeah. I don't have an issue with any, anybody keeping the show going, you know. Um, Riddle and Jimmy Uso, dude, what a great tease this match was because like you had one half of RK bro against one half of the Usos. You had one of the Usos messing around outside. And at the end of it, it's like, yeah, don't forget there's a tag match on Friday to unify those tag titles. And this whole match played out so incredibly that you're like, well, if that was only half of it, 
what's the full match going to look like? Like, I thought this was done perfectly. They even had a little video package in the back of them talking a little shit, too. And I was like, oh, this is an amazing way to tease. You got to watch SmackDown, you know? Do you think Do you think they're going to pull the trigger and actually unify the belt? Yes. Or do you think to be a smaz and blow it off to hell and sell? Oh, do I think it's going to happen on SmackDown or Hell in a Cell? That's a good question. Because yeah. I do think it's going to happen one way or the other. Uh, you would think it would happen in Hell in a Cell. But I don't know. In the, in the I guess cell? Roman would have to be involved, right? To get to get it to the cell. Roman would have to stop yeah. it from happening. And then you'd have to have Adam Pearce come out and be like, oh, no. Good. Right, right, right. I could see that. I do think they're going to unify. Do you think that they unify it with RK Bro? I think, or do you think they put it on, put both of them on Usos? They got to put it on I, Usos. I think the Usos, Usos. yeah. <laughs> gotta play yeah. It. It's a good thing Beard's not here today. It's a good thing Beard's not here today. He'd just, just start power. yelling. He'd have been I yelling his, his head off right now if he heard that from two people. <laughs> I mean, if, if anyone, if anyone should be the first, they should, they should be that. Yeah. I could see that. Hmm. Yeah. But I could also see them trying to to create a little bit of a divide and a little bit of a weakness to the bloodline, just to create a little bit of interest. You know. You could do that during the summer, though. You could. Yeah, you got time. You got yeah. time. Uh. You gotta have some dominance right now. Though. Yeah. Shakes, do you think that they unify it on SmackDown, or do you think it moves on to Hell in a Cell? I think it gets moved on to Hell in a Cell. What do you think, Shakes? Um, I think it happens this uh, on a SmackDown. And the only reason why is because I think Hell in a Cell is so packed. They have a lot of matches and a lot of good matches going on. What, do, what have they got so far? They've got two matches booked so far. But so matches. there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of possibilities to go with. What I will say is very possible. Is crazy. Like, no, maybe <laughs> and maybe Shakes can test to this one. What if they unify it on SmackDown by putting them on an RK Bro, and Roman gets super pissed and says, "You better get those back at Hell in a Cell," and then you have the rematch in Hell in a Cell to move the unified titles to the Usos or keep them on on RK Bro Double Down. I could see that happening why would for you sure. Put it on RK Bro, though. Why would you put him on him put in the first place? Because Roman's going to be the one who has the pull to get it in Hell in a Cell if his guys lost. Where if the Usos won, then you'd have RK Bro trying to appeal to the Usos to give them a match at Hell in a Cell. Why would they? You know? Yeah. Where the Bloodline can demand a match. That's why I don't think it's going to be on the card, man. It's <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna be too much matches, man. Too many impact matches. Right, two. Could be. Got two of mm -hmm. them so far. <laughs> uh, what do you think about uh, uh, the Judgment Day and the new the new Bullet Club, as it were? You got Finn Balor, AJ Styles, and Liv Morgan joining Liv forces. Liv Morgan. It's great. I love it. That's pretty damn cool. I did and Liv Morgan looks so excited, it's crazy. Liv Morgan's oh, an actual yeah. crazy person, and I love it. I don't like uh, the backstage interaction that they had, right? When they when they came to her, they like, yeah, you know, we got to watch each other's back. Okay, yeah. that, I like that part. But when she answers, she's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> you got AJ Styles. And Finn Balor coming to you and saying, "Yeah, join up with us and let's go and and and, and get our at our enemies." And you like, oh, I don't know. I did think they played a little weird. There was a point there where it looked like Liv was almost playing it like a shy high schooler being flirted with, and I was all like, "That's a little weird," uh -huh. you know. But at the same time, how different is that from a perceived rookie? around two perceived long-term veterans from all over the world you know like lives only wrestled in wwe so it could also be a shyness of i don't know if i'm anywhere near your guys's caliber i don't know if i'm yeah, not here, worthy right? yeah not worthy. right uh but did you guys hear that uh, edge wanted harland on his uh, little squad 
Uh, I saw a headline released. somewhere about it, but where did you where did you read that? Uh, Twitter. Mm-hmm. Wrestling. Okay. Wrestling news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did Harlan but, say uh, it or Edge? Uh, Edge. Edge said Edge. it. Yeah, he uh, asked. He asked for it. That'd have been cool, dude. Harlan was a beast, but yeah. We'll see what he's up to next. Uh. What do you think you would call this new version of the club? We've already had the OC original club, the club when it was first uh, in its oh. WWE iteration, and then you've had the oh, Bowler I got, Club. I got Bullet Club, uh, B U L L I Z Club. So it's like Bullet half a club. Bullet. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> when you say it's half a what? Half bullet, it's half, half a live. Bullet, half live. Yeah. Bull live club. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> all right. I'll work on graphics tonight. It's <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's better than anything I got. So unless you got something better, shakes. Um. No, I just got the bullet club. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, Alexa Bliss has new music yet again. This time, it's much more punk rocky. She's been posting some of the lyrics on there. It seems pretty cool. Uh, and she had a match here with Sonya Deville. Shakes, what do you think of this match, Alexa and Sonya? Uninteresting. Uninteresting. But I um, did notice the new music, and it's, like, more, you know, happy, friendly. Like pop punk. Friendly. Yeah, this is more. I almost wondered if she got bowling friendly. for soup to make it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, you know, you can kind of see it, like, um, you know, point to the crowd. And, hey. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know me. That, did you that watch the match or did you, did you not really right. watch the match? Well, I was into it, but wasn't into it. <laughs> gotcha. My thought, I was trying to figure out and tell me if you guys saw the same thing. It looked crazy stiff. Like, it looked like Sonya was really yanking around Alexa harshly, trying to look good. And it looked like Alexa was incredibly uncomfortable this whole time. And it was hard to tell if it was just, like, yeah, if it was like a really good way of playing it or if it was just really, because at the end of it, Alexa walked over to her corner, yanked Lily off that podium and like walked off. Like, she was nowhere near any of it. The second it was over, she just was, like, out. And it, it looked, looked a lot like to me like... It was the first time they ever wrestled together. Yes. And it looked way harsher than it probably needed to be, is what it looked yeah. like to me. I don't think any of those wrestlers really liked Sonya the best. <laughs> I think about probably by that time, <laughs> that time in the show, all the news about Sasha and Naomi circulating... Mm-hmm. And their heads probably weren't really in the game. Yeah, if I had game. to give them an excuse, I just I've seen some criticisms where they talk about how back in the day the idea was to make it look as painful with, at pos, as possible without it being painful at all. And nowadays the game is more like uh, make it look painful and have it be painful, or almost like make it look like it's not as painful as it actually is, and it's backwards, mm-hmm. right? Where this looked like. Right really uncomfortable I don't know it was tough it was a little tough to watch on that one and it made me wonder what we're going to see next from both of them because I don't know it did not look cooperative it looked like a lot of that's that's Alexa's only what second or third match yeah coming back she didn't look like the one who was being unreasonably rough like it looked like Sonya was punching her and that Alexa was like the fuck and so much so that it looked like Alexa slapped her and was like, fucking calm down. <laughs> like, there was a certain part of it, it felt like it was falling apart to me where Sonya's like, no, I have to make this look good, but I'm going to do it by actually beating you up. Like, it's not the idea, I suppose. But what do I know? I don't know. And if that's what it looked like, but it wasn't that at all, then they did great. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, realistically, oh, yeah. if that was yeah. my impression of it, but that wasn't the case of it, then you guys did it perfectly. That was amazing. Like, right. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, right on that. Uh, all right, so let's 
Let's go on Cody Rhodes promo where he challenges Seth Rollins to hell in a cell. I'm loving this iteration of Cody. I just finished Broken Skull Sessions, and I feel like it's a must-watch for people. Like, I still get chills when I hear him really start breaking down a lot of the stuff about Mania and all of it that, that it was. Like, it was cool because I was telling Sportsbeard why I couldn't quite put my finger on, without just being generically petty, of why I enjoy Cody in WWE so much more than I was enjoying him in AEW. Uh, without being just petty, petty, and being like, well, because I like WWE more, which is probably partly part of it. Um, but I feel like that he's being presented in a way that he wasn't being presented in AEW. Yes, he's got the same entrance. Yes, he has the same music. Yes, he dresses the same. But his story is something you can kind of latch into and something that feels more... Uh, I, would, I mean, it feels genuine and authentic to a degree. It still feels like a wrestling story, but it feels something like... What you always wished it kind of was. And I think part of the disconnect with, with Cody in AEW was the story was never quite what you thought it was supposed to be. Everything he said and did, you're going, now why are you doing that? Why are you saying it that way? You know what I mean? Like, it was always off the beaten path in some weird way. Well, this uh, is a great re redemption story. Feels like. For, yeah. Like the first half of his career, you know, he got fucked over. Yeah. Now he can finally redeem himself, you know, do it for his dad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a great built-in story. Yeah. Shakes, what do you think about this version of Cody versus the AEW version? Uh, I kind of attest this to the AEW version. Yeah. Like, I think we got this version of Cody because of the AEW. Yes. For sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, it's it's because he found himself. He found exactly his character, and some you know sometimes it takes longer for others mm -hmm. to really find that narrative and find their niche. It didn't. I mean, it took a while for Roman Reigns, right? Yep. So yeah. um. I think, you know, now he's finally found it. He found that his character and the way they're using it and, and with the storyline of the redemption, as you said, um, it just all makes it like it's right. It is it's yeah. all fits. Like, this is how it's supposed to be. Like, he, like in his song is, you know, wrestling has more than one royal family, right? Like. Yeah. You, he, he is a prince in this, and he should be treated as such. So, yeah, I think yeah. Um, we get in this, Cody, because of the AEW code. Yeah, I agree with that. Yep. It's just cool, man. He's doing awesome. Uh, Did you like the, uh, the the countdown clock? The countdown clock was wild, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Fucking two-hour countdown clock, top of the 10 o'clock hour, you're going to see Cody, like... They've never done anything like that before where it's all like, hey, just so you know, this is exactly the time this person's going to do the promo. Where you can sometimes right. guess when they yeah, say like, hey, Becky Lynch is going to address right. the crowd. Yeah, the nut. yeah, exactly. Um, but you can like sometimes guess where it's all like Becky Lynch will address the crowd tonight. And you go, OK, it's going to be on the top of the top of the hour somewhere because that's where they like to put their top stars. Right. But for them to say two hours in <laughs> on the top of this hour, you're going to have a Cody Rhodes segment. They're and really saying Kevin like, hey. If you decide you're going to tune out, here's the time to come back. Like, that's crazy. And Kevin Owens yipping about it, too. Yeah. Kevin <laughs> Owens is talking shit about it online. It was so funny. Um, speaking of Kevin Owens, though, we did have Kevin Owens backstage talking about Otis's uh, barbecue sauce issues on the DNA test. Chad Gable said he's going to fight Ezekiel. Uh, and ultimately, Kevin Owens does come out to sit on commentary during the Chad Gable-Ezekiel match. This whole thing, top to bottom, was just so good. I loved the seriousness of Kevin Owens. I loved uh, how every time they would say something, he's like, well, he's a liar. It's like, oh, I guess he's a liar too. Then uh, just incredible. What did you guys think of Ezekiel versus Chad Gable and, and Kevin Owens on commentary? We'll start with Six Crow and then go Shakes. It was fun from top to bottom. Um, I thought Kevin Owens on commentary was the icing on the cake. Uh, even Otis standing next to him, uh, going, you know, come on, coach, uh, cheering him on. I thought that was great. Uh, 
I was even surprised that uh, Ezekiel went over and uh, and beat Gable. Yeah, cause um, I I think that Gable should have won this match, right? Cause you know, yeah, you know, um, first of all, I love Gable, man, and the way he brings. <laughs> and, um, to me, it's it's like um. And maybe y'all can disagree, you know, I I don't care. But to me, <laughs> he's kind of <laughs> like a, a younger version of Kurt Angle. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. And a little, little smaller, a little, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smaller frame, but a lot of similarities to Kurt Angle, especially in um, younger WWE Kurt Angle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So um I love Gable man. Gable's awesome man. And um I think the match was good too. Uh Gable always puts on a underrated match. Like you don't sit there and really say, "Oh, I want to I can't wait to see a Gable match." But when you see a Gable match, you're like, well, no, I wasn't disappointed." Yeah. yeah. I I wasn't big on him until he got with Otis, and then I saw that he, I, like, I missed out. I his feel like I missed out on so much. His personality came out, yeah. Yep. Yeah. His personality came out once he got with Otis, though. He wasn't like that before. He was really dull, but he really brought out his uh, his personality once he got with Otis and um, that, that whole academy thing. Yeah. It just was like, hey, you know what? Go ahead. Be creative. And they they let him go, and he, he took it and ran with it, man. Yeah, absolutely. Because every yeah. time we'd see his match, I was, like you said, never excited to see a Chad Gable match, you know, just being honest. But every time you saw it, you go, oh, my God, like, he's so strong. He's so good. He's so fluid. He know, Like, you were always blown away and impressed, but then you also forgot. And then every time the next one came out, like, every now and again, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this will probably be good. Chad Gable's pretty good. And then you watch it and you go, no, he's, like, really fucking good. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Daniel Bryan was the same way when he... Yeah, he first started. I'm like, I had no interest. He didn't look like a star, but he was fantastic. And the more yeah. I saw him, the more he was, you know, like one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. And this personality of Chad Gable is amazing. So, hundred percent. This whole yeah. thing was great. I love Kevin Owens on commentary, um, talking shit about it all. I don't have a problem with Ezekiel winning because I think that it furthers the story some, um, but. I could see where a win on Chad Gable could have been something. I think the the thing is is that Ezekiel's not the one chasing the match with Gable, which is why I think Ezekiel winning is why it works. Because if Chad Gable was, if Chad Gable won, Ezekiel would be like, all right, fine. I didn't want to match. The, you know what I mean? Like he, did, he has no reason yeah. to come back. Where um, Ezekiel's essentially being hunted by Kevin Owens, Gable, and Otis. So if he wins, they're going to keep trying to come after him because they want to beat him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, if there's the, the final match is going to be, you know, Ezekiel versus Kevin Owens. You want to be yeah. strong going in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You want it to be a thing. It's it's building towards something like that for sure. Um, Just briefly, Lacey Evans got introduced. She came out, started around. She was talking. She cut a little, uh, a little thing in the ring there where she was talking about the military, thanking for them service. Um. It was all well and good. I've seen... I understand the criticism where this is too much Lacey. Yeah. But if you can isolate this in a bubble and look at the way that Lacey's being presented on Raw differently than the way she was just presented on SmackDown, there was too much on SmackDown. It was five weeks of these videos on SmackDown. And if you can forget that and just think of how it's been on Raw, this has actually been perfect. You had one video segment where it broke down her whole story. You mm-hmm. had her come out this week and cut this. Next week you put her in a match. And it is the perfect way to build that as opposed to five weeks of beating that story to death. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't think the fans are going to be too receptive of her. I agree. In about two or three weeks from now. I think something's got to happen. Something's got to shift here. I agree. Yeah. Shakes thoughts yeah. on Lacey Evans? Tired of it. 
See? Now, if you were to <laughs> if you were to bubble the raw thing where you had the one video last week and this thing here, would you think you probably wouldn't feel as tired of her? Because I think it was the five weeks on SmackDown of those videos that really got us tired of her. Mm-hmm. And I think if you were to isolate this in a bubble, that That's this is how it should awesome. have been from the beginning with. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, it's Lacey's the dragging on issues. that made it gruesome. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's just a shame. It's a shame because they clearly figured out the exact perfect way to represent her. And it was literally five weeks too late. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like they should just waited five weeks and done this this way now, and we've all been like, "Oh, this is cool, new Lacey." Right. Uh, what'd you guys think of Carmella and Dana and our truth back in a story together? I think Carmella's so good, and I love seeing her talking to our truth again. She wants to take on Dana Brooke, which I'm have no problem with. Carmella's just so so good that it's a little weird to see her in the twenty four seven title picture again, but it made me laugh. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the whole 24 7 segment, so yeah, I won't say nothing about it. I don't like, I don't like, like, like this thing. Mm-hmm. I like, I don't like this thing of the 24 seven. Yeah. Like, at first, like you know, um, it was the hardcore title, mm-hmm. so okay, make that the 24 seven hit somebody over there or somebody and take the title. That was cool. This is just like, okay, let's put a title on the guest just to just say that they was a champion. Right. Or let's just put a title on somebody just to keep them relevant on and on TV. Mm-hmm. And for that, I, I just don't like it. For, but um, Carmella, uh, I think that they are struggling to keep a storyline with her. Mm-hmm. Like, keep a... And I like the um the the character they have, you know, where she's just, I'm just beautiful, and she wears the mask so that it won't mess up her looks and all that. That's <laughs> awesome. That's great. That's great. But capitalize on it. You know, I don't think that they're capitalizing on it. Like, they can do so much more with this, you know? Yeah. And they just pigeonholing themselves, man. I think that's the theme of the day. <laughs> just pigeonholing yourself. Yeah, totally. I agree. I agree. And I think that Carmella is one of the absolute best and one of the most underrated women on the roster. So... I think that she should be in a highlighted story more often. So I'm not sure what the 24 seven is going to do, but, but seeing her interact with our truth again was kind of a nice callback. If we end up seeing a pretty oh, solid yeah, match between her and Dana, had the, uh, the 15 second dance off. They used to have that. <laughs> and then when they were doing the 24 seven title thing, that's what was funny with, uh, our truth going over. So like Carmela jump on my back and help me get my baby back. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> That's just sad. No. Uh, but let's see. Main event. We ended up Oscar versus Becky Lynch. We had Bianca on commentary. I or she wasn't quite on commentary. She was sitting by commentary, right? I don't think she ended up saying much as far as it went, but. No. <laughs> I thought it was badass, man. Like, I thought this was awesome. It was, I mean, for something that they threw together kind of last minute because of everything that was going on, Bianca looked great. Becky was talking her shit. Oscar looked great. Ultimately, uh, Becky goes for the umbrella, gets misted in the face, sells the hell out of the mist, and Oscar wins, so she's going to be facing Bianca at Hell in a Cell. I had, like, zero complaints about any of this. I've been saying for a while I missed the mist. I know a lot of people didn't. I've seen back and forth. I think when Oscar has the green drippy paint and stuff that the mist feels like a part of that that's missing, if I'm being honest. Yeah. The other day I saw the Oscar Funko Pop with the green on it, and I was like, oh, should I get that? And I thought, eh, she doesn't even do the mist anymore, and I didn't. But at the same time, I already have a signed Oscar Pop here. Nice. So, so I, don't need, uh, I don't need more Oscar Pops, but I liked it. 
I liked all of it. Uh, I love the way that Becky sells it. They even did that uh, thing in the back. She was screaming, crying for help. Yeah. I got such that a kick out funny. of it. She goes, I did everything right. <laughs> so funny. Uh, Shakes, what do you think about this main event and everybody involved? Um, first off, I think both of them are legitimate. Yes. So it just legitimized everything about the uh, woman's title for Raw. Mm. That's, that's number one. Then number two, I like the Miss too, right? Because it gives um like um pays homage to uh, Great Muda and guys like that, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. um I I love that that stick with tradition. I'm a traditional type of guy, mm. so to have that. I'm like, it, it, it feels at home. It, it makes me feel like, oh, I'm 16 again or, yeah. you know, when I seen these other guys, right? Um, and then, you know, the explanation of why, you know what I mean? It, 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 it blinds you, it paralyzes you, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's great. <laughs> it's great. Well, and Becky was protecting the ref the whole time here. I love that because there's been so many times we've seen mist or or sprays shit in people's eyes, and they just lay back, and the referee has to look at them while counting. The way that <laughs> Becky, every time she takes the paint or the mist, she turns away from the ref. She covers her body. The way that Asuka pinned Becky by sitting on her head, the referee couldn't have seen it until it was too late. You know what I mean? Like, right. Mm-hmm. Becky's always protecting the ref. Well, where's the ref? You know what I mean? Like, she's making sure the ref doesn't look like a total idiot because so many times and these type of things happen, the ref just looks like a fool. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's protecting the brand, really. Yep. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it makes it like, okay, that's explainable. Yep. Instead of somebody actually, um, one, two, three, and you looking in their eyes while they, you know, and you're like, yeah. you don't see that? <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah and even um, even wearing the dark you know what i mean because sometimes they're all wearing like white and then they get misted and like their whole fucking shirt is black or green or whatever and the referees are supposed to not all of a sudden see that they're covered in shit right so yeah, yeah i just becky always protects the ref and i always appreciate that i think it's awesome because not everyone She's seems to consider that man yeah yeah the only Excuse criticism me. I had about that match was the uh, just the predictable throw the uh, challenger into the champion. Right. Sitting ringside. But it didn't work. And that's why I liked it because it's stereotypical, <laughs> but it always works, right? You do that, they interfere, ta da, every time. Bianca was bigger than that. She was willing to be the bigger woman and let it play out and not give in to what Becky was taunting her with, right? So I agreed that it was one of those spots that you knew was going to happen. And that's yeah. probably why they did it, because you knew it was going to happen, but let's not have it play out the way that it always happens. So I thought it was great that they used it the way they did. Personal. Sort of like um, when uh, on that AEW show, when, um, uh, what's his name? One that came out, he was with um, Hit Row. Swerve? Swer yeah, there you go. Yeah. I'm like, what's his name? But yeah, uh, when Swerve came out and it didn't even uh, cause him to uh, lose the match on. Um, yeah, with Ricky. FTW. Yeah. Yeah. And you're kind of like, like okay. I, yeah, because usually like those guys come down and then it's like, oh, it's the distraction, and then they lose the match and whoop, you know what I mean? Yeah. But this was like came down and it still didn't cause no effect, and this was the same yeah. thing. Yeah, my only issue there was that Hobbs didn't go flat and swerve. Hobbs was ringside, like whatever, and you're like, dude, dude's right. coming out to bother right. your boy. Go get him, like. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Stop him. It was funny because by the time Hobbs popped up at the end of the match, you're just kind of like, where the fuck were you two minutes ago? Where were you? <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, didn't cost him the match, so, you know, whatever. Uh, but, yeah, I love this main event. I thought it was great. Uh, it's not what we were meant to get, but it definitely delivered. You know, I think that 
for a show that seemed to be a little bit uh, in shambles by the time it went live. Uh, they pulled it together and, and gave us something something worth it. I think. I here's the other thing too, a lot of people, as we wrap up, a lot of people were talking about Naomi and Sasha, and they they hearkened back to to Austin. Oh, they didn't talk this way about Austin, but they did, and. Um, talking about Austin knowing his worth and all that stuff. The other thing that no one's bringing up is that Steve Austin has said countless times that he regrets having walked out in that, in that instance that he thinks he did the wrong thing that if he could go back and redo it, he would, he would not have walked out. I'm not saying Sasha and Naomi should not have walked out. I am saying it's a very complex situation. And when we're trying to use examples, Let's also make sure that we do reference those who lived through those things before and how they felt in hindsight. I wonder if down the line, if Sasha and Naomi may say, yeah, maybe I sh- we should have done something else. However, Stone Cold did say at the time that he didn't offer them a second solution. He just said, I'm not doing that. And they said, well, what do you want us to do? And he goes, not that. And he walked out. According to the stories we're seeing, Sasha and Naomi had like four or five meetings of offering other solutions and not being heard. So in that regard, it's not the same. I think it's also important to know they're standing up for what they believe in and not being listened to time and time again. And I do think that there's, like we said, a time to stand up for yourself and a time to uh, um, stand up for the things that you believe in and you're passionate about. And if there's one thing we know, Sasha and Bailey both are incredibly passionate about those tag titles and want them to mean something. And I think they should mean something. And I think that they do mean something at the right times, right? Natty, cried when she won those with Tamina because it mm-hmm. meant that much. Yeah. You know, Sasha and Bailey cried when they won them in the first place because it meant that much. We see those boyhood dreams come true. Those women dreams come true and they get choked up in these moments. And if you don't protect the division and the titles, those moments go away. And those are the moments that we're all here for and living for. We all remember the boyhood dream with Shawn Michaels, whether you like Shawn or not. It felt like a right. moment in that time, you know? Right. If we don't protect those things, you don't have Natty being able to live that dream and from her lineage. She wanted the tag titles because it was uh, the title her dad Mick held. Foley. Mick Foley. Mick Foley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, Mrs. Foley's baby boy finally did it. Right, right, <laughs> right. If you don't Mrs. protect those Foley things, it doesn't ball. mean anything, you know, like... So in that regard, I'm not going to knock anyone for walking out for feeling that those titles deserve more prestige because I agree. Same time, I'm not paid millions of dollars to do certain things. So it's hard for me to say this is what should or should not be done. Realistically, none of us know what should or shouldn't be done because none of us are in the position that those people are in and only they know. It's very much the same that I say we can't criticize people when they decide to sign or leave any company. Because only right. those people know what's best for them and their family and their business. All we can say is, ah, it's a shame I don't get to see them on the show I watch regularly. Or, I'm so excited to see them on the show I watch regularly. But we can't make judgments on their decisions. And I think that that's the important thing we also need to make here. Is we can't judge harshly on the decision made by either people in this situation. Because we really don't understand what's going on in their heads because we don't have to deal with what they have to deal with. We're not running a billion dollar corporation. We're not Mm -hmm. women who have been grinding for 10 years to get some recognition and respect. I'm not saying anyone did anything wrong. I'm not saying anybody did anything right. It's playing out the way it's playing out between the people who know what's right and wrong. And I trust them to do what they feel is right on both sides, you know? Yeah. Just, you know, make sure that they come out with something that's right for all parties mm-hmm. once again. Yep. Not just for Sasha and Naomi. Not just for WWE. Yep. For WWE, Sasha and Naomi, and the fans. Yep. And the rest of the women in the locker room. You know what I mean? Like, those Natty's dream was to hold a tag title. Because that's the title her dad held. But, but Sasha and Bailey made that happen. You know what I mean? And that's not a knock on Natty. It's just to say that Bailey was tweeting forever, what I want doesn't exist yet. Her biggest dreams don't exist yet. 
And we're getting to a point where she keeps tweeting it, and we're like, what the fuck does she want that's not out there? Because it was always easy to be like, oh, a women's rumble, oh, women's tag titles. Like, it was always kind of something, right? right? At this point, she's still saying it, and you're kind of like, god damn, she's got every dream in the world, and she's willing to fight for it. And willing to fight for it is what we need in the locker room. It's what they need to represent. Natty doesn't cry because she holds that title if Sasha and Bailey weren't knocking on Vince's door every day. So... I'm not trying to discount anybody on this. You know what I'm saying? No, it's well said. Situation. Yeah. Uh, Do you find it kind of, kind of weird that uh, both Lotharios was on Raw? What do you mean? Was Why it? was it weird that Lotharios was on Raw? They're, they're a SmackDown team, aren't they? I don't know, man. Oh, oh it's not a big deal. <laughs> Dude. Not anymore. Like that's what I'm saying. Like they don't have enough wrestlers, man. Yeah. They don't even care no more. Yeah. There's a certain degree. As much as I don't want the brand split to stop, it should be a bigger deal when somebody's on the wrong brand. You know what right. I mean? Like yeah. you're right in that. Like, hey, Viking Raiders show up on NXT. That's kind of wild. Los Authorius right. on Raw didn't even notice. But if Roman's on Raw, you notice. If Sam, like Kevin Owens wearing a Sami Zayn Forever shirt on Raw, you notice. Yep. Lothario should be on a higher on a higher platform that we notice that they're on the wrong show. So I apologize for that, but I think that having people on the different shows is cool because it feels fresh, but not if you don't notice. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. That's what uh, I'm saying, man. This brand shit, man. That they gotta get some more talent. You need some people. Uh, but they're doing a lot down in NXT, and tomorrow we're going to talk about NXT and what's going on down there, some AEW. Was there anything left of this week that either of you guys wanted to touch on that we did not? Uh, you excited about the Ric Flair match? <laughs> we're the, definitely uh... going to talk about that tomorrow, but Shakes, <laughs> what do you think about Ric Flair coming back for one more match? Man, 72, right? Uh, 73? Yep. Yeah. I don't know how they doing it, man. I don't mm. know how they doing it. Him, Sting. I don't know how they doing it, man. Yeah. Well, now, now apparently it'll be a six-man tag match. Yes. So it's it going to be, be Flair and FTR against <laughs> Rock and Roll Express and somebody. And I would say this. If y'all think that if this is going to be the last match of Ric Flair, that he's just going <laughs> to give you some half-ass <laughs> match... <laughs> <laughs> you think he gonna give you some half ass match? No, he's going all out, man. This is Ric Flair we're talking you, about. You think we're gonna see some blood? Oh, oh for we sure. Gonna <laughs> we're gonna see for some blood. Sure. Six girl, what do you think? You excited to see Ric Flair one more time? Why not? It can't be any worse than Vince. <laughs> Fuck it. Uh, we'll yeah. dig into the Vince conversation tomorrow, but I will say this. When yeah. you watched Vince in that match... Vince didn't take any bumps because he knew. That yeah. match was all story right, and no right. match. Ric Flair's not known for all story, <laughs> no match. So I think that there's an yeah. inherently massive difference between Vince and Flair in these perspective matches. Vince was out there not taking bumps. And the one bump he did take, people criticized the shit out of. Yeah. But, it, uh, yeah, that match was between... That, uh, that, that stunner? The stunner he yeah. took? Yeah. Oh, it was the most uncoordinated stunner I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. but that match between Vince and Pat McAfee was Pat McAfee against Austin Theory Part 2 because Austin Theory was the one getting bump, getting all the bumps for... Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, was, it wasn't played out like Vince's last match. It just happened to be a match that Vince was heavily involved in. So yeah. uh, I do think there's differences. We'll dig in deeper tomorrow night on Episode 1 here in the Dive Bar. Um but yeah, absolutely. Uh, Six Crow, oh, thanks for coming through. Tomorrow? Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I don't think Six Crow's going to make it tomorrow. I think that we're going to be a pretty <laughs> packed house. I think Klump's finally making his return. Amanda doesn't ever miss. Uh, and, and Shakes, I think you're going to come through tomorrow, right? Yep, I'll be in. It's going to be a later show again, just so you know. So uh, probably closer to that, that same time last week. But Six Crow, thank you for coming through and chilling out with us. We no appreciate problem. it. Uh, I had fun. Yeah, tell people where they can find you if you ever do anything. 
Uh, I'm at six crow everywhere, and I don't do really anything. <laughs> Just hanging out, man. <laughs> yeah. Hanging out. Go find and me in the Discord. Find him in the Discord. Also, now that you got all that equipment and you're sounding sweet, I love having you on. We're definitely going to keep you um, in, in the fold, and anybody who does listen who wants Six Crows takes, he's available, and he's got that brand-new, fresh mic, that <laughs> badass new headset. He's got faster internet. He upgraded his whole life because I criticized him too hard. So, wow. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Hey. Yeah. I had so, fun. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. And Shakes, thank you for coming through. Tell people where they can find the shakedown. Yeah, man. I'm on YouTube, the Shakedown Sports Podcast. Definitely check us out. Check uh, our website out, the Shakedown Sports Podcast.com. Mm-hmm. Um, you can check me out, Shakes NYG on Twitter, and uh, the Shakedown Show on Twitter as well, man. Follow all those things, man. We do a show Monday through Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time to uh, 9, 10 o'clock. So um, every day we on there. Well, Monday through Friday, of course. But, yeah, join us, man. It's always fun. We talk all sports, not just Giants, all sports. So <laughs> just join us. And uh, oh, once man. again, man, it was a pleasure being on the show with you, Six Crow. Yes. Always a pleasure, uh, Ref. I'll holler at you tomorrow on some AEW stuff. Absolutely, guys. Thank you for coming through and being in our drinking buddies, and thank you to all the drinking buddies who came through to to check us out as well. Uh, Guys, that's us. We are at WOTR the show. I am at Ref Marsh, and we're going to be back here tomorrow night for a brand new episode one right here in the dive bar of the IWC. That's the last call. Continue to support us or buy us a drink by following and putting the eye and subscribe on Twitch. Or subscribe and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to us. Cheers! I would never have a drink that's less than on the rocks.